If you have set foot in a library in the past few years, you will undoubtedly have noticed that they're not just repositories for books. If you haven't dropped by, you're in for some surprises, good ones, that might just make you see libraries as vital places ready to serve a larger social purpose. With us to explain, let's welcome, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Shamichael Holman, Loeb Fellow at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University and co-founder of Libraries as Bridges. In Thornbury, Ontario, Sabrina Saunders, CEO and Board Secretary at the Blue Mountains Public Library. In Kitchener, Ontario, Mary Chevro, CEO of the Kitchener Public Library. And here in our studio, Vickery Bowles, so-called city librarian at the Toronto Public Library, which she informs me is the largest library system in North America. Yes. In terms of numbers of branches. Yes. Marvelous. Uh, great to have you back here in our studio. And to our friends in mm -hmm. Points Beyond, thank you for joining us tonight on TVO. I just want to set up our discussion uh, because, of course, uh, you would all be all too aware that many people have been predicting the end of libraries for a long time. So let's go back and take a look here. Shall we, uh, Sheldon, bring this graphic up if you would. Here is something from 2005 from the MIT's Technology Review, so Michael, not far from you, entitled The Death of Libraries. Now that Google has agreed to scan millions of books, can the disappearance of libraries themselves be far behind, they asked. Let's zoom ahead to 2012. This article was in Forbes. As someone who has spent a fair amount of time analyzing business disruption, I think it's pretty clear that libraries are eventually going to fade away. And one more, this from TechCrunch in 2013. The internet has replaced the importance of libraries as a repository for knowledge. And digital distribution has replaced the role of a library as a central hub. This is evolution, not devolution. Okay, Shamichael, get us started on this. What did these predictors fail to understand? Because you're still here. Yeah, we're all still here. I think one of the things that those predictors failed to acknowledge was uh, individuals who are actually using libraries, the people who come in, in the library each and every day for a variety of reasons. But I think these individuals also failed to take into account uh, the way that libraries saw themselves in the community and the vital needs and services that the library was providing uh, to, to, to their communities. Sabrina, how about you? What did they fail to understand in those predictions? I think they didn't understand that we have been around as a library sector since the days of Alexandria, more than 2,000 years ago, and we keep morphing into what our communities need. Vickery, uh, let me ask you this. If I asked you 25 years ago, what's a library for? You'd say, well, it's, you know, mostly it's a place to store physical books. If I were to ask you to characterize what a library is today, mm -hmm. how different would the answer be? Well, and, you know, I think what, what, what we're thinking about is we used to have, you know, we've always been about access to information and education, and that's, you know, been a great equalizer for everyone. But in the 21st century, access to technology is just as important, and no one can be successful in today's world without access to technology and know how to use it, and that's where public libraries come in. We provide access to technology. We teach people how to use it. We have um, everyday technology that most of us take to, for granted, but many people don't have access to. And then we have emerging technologies, such as um, green screens and 3D printers and Mac Pro computers. And, and so people come to the library to access content, um, to learn about technology and, and develop their digital literacy skills, but they also come to create content. So that's a big difference in the 21st century. Mary, if I asked you the same question, the difference between the library of 25 years ago and today, what would you say? I think it's the opportunity to, uh, to be together, to commune. I think that social inclusion element, you know, there aren't very many places left actually where people can come, gather, uh, create, or just be uh, in, in, in society. So that social inclusion component has changed and we really have been able to uh, uh, develop our programs and services to meet those needs. Shamika, let me ask you about one of your previous experiences, because I gather you were uh, involved in the redesigning of the Cosset Library in Memphis, and in doing so, you came to Toronto to check out what was happening in this city here. What did you see or learn about here that you brought to Memphis with you? Oh, so much. You know, I had a wonderful opportunity. The library project that we did here in Memphis, uh, under the direction of Keenan McCloy, who's a phenomenal leader, 
uh, the city mayor, uh, in, a, in a national initiative called Reimagine the Civic Commons, afforded me the opportunity to come to Toronto uh, in the middle of 2018. Uh, and we visited a number of places, not just libraries. We went to uh, uh, community centers. We went to parks. Uh, and of course, you know, as someone who works for libraries, I had to sneak away and check out a couple of libraries. And so, you know, one of the really interesting things that I saw, and Victor's already talked about this, is just the way that they were thinking about technology and how they were thinking about not only giving access to technology, of course, she's talked about green screens and uh, uh, various recording equipment, uh, but also kind of providing access through technology. And what I mean by that is not just saying, hey, here's a range of things that we have in terms of computers and digital resources, but here's how you can use these things. Here's uh, uh, fundamental ways that you can use it to improve your life, uh, to, to upskill, to earn a new hobby, to uh, maybe change your uh, job prospects. And so that was really interesting. Also, something that I really loved was at the time, uh, was a, an innovator in residence program that I really, really love. And, and I saw this as a really interesting way of bringing the community in and really leveraging the, the knowledge and the strengths and the skills of the community and making the library a very relational place, not just a place where, hey, I come and I get a book and I leave, or I come and, and I, I attend the library program, I leave. But it's like, no, I'm going to actually bring something with me. I'm going to bring uh, uh, things that I'm passionate about. And I'm going to share those uh, in a public space like like a library. And so we were able to use those things and, and really infuse a lot of that into the project that we did in Memphis. Sabrina, let me pick up on that with you. If we were to go into the Blue Mountains Public Library in Thornbury today, uh, what would be what would we be able to do beyond just borrow some books? Well, that's an excellent question. We have a creator space, which is what we call our maker space. Many libraries have these. And it is a place where you can come and play and explore and test out technology. So from little children being able to do animation programs to adults coming in and borrowing our professional videography equipment, uh, whether it's a case where you wanna do an ad for your business or you just wanna have you know, a great family event, these are things that you can do in libraries today. Our uh, coding programs are active for all children. And one of the speakers mentioned, uh, these are the skills that we need to build in our citizenry. It's not just about fun and playtime. Sometimes it's a case where you want to test something out before you purchase it. Other times it's the only opportunity you have for economic reasons. But our society is requiring these aspects of digital literacy. So we're building these, these skill sets in our citizens. So hopefully we're building new job opportunities for adults and certainly uh, making sure that our youth are going to be strong employees of the future. Vickery, when did the library become more than just about borrowing books? Well, libraries have always been about that, to be perfectly honest. About more than just borrowing books? Just about borrowing books. You know, um, we've had, for instance, newcomer services in our libraries for many, many years. And this is where newcomer um, uh, agencies come into the library. We have them in about 16 of our branches. And they support newcomers uh, in, in making their way and in integrating into uh, Canadian and Toronto society. And, uh, and so public libraries have been about that for a long, long time. We support all sorts of different literature financial literacy, um, uh, digital literacy that we've been talking about. Uh, so the library's been about, about that for a long time. But certainly, I think we think about books, and we think about reading programs, we think about story times, which are all still the heart and soul of public libraries. But there's always been so much more going on. It's just that in recent years, it's accelerated. Yeah. Mary, I want to ask you about the pandemic, because I know if, if my own local library was any indication, uh, it, it really killed them not to be allowed to be open at the time. And, and we, you know, something was definitely lost. How did the library system do what it did or do what its traditional mission is when uh, you couldn't keep the doors open? Well, it, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, public libraries in Ontario and around the country actually were remarkable in how they did keep their doors open. Even, even if we couldn't physically uh, be in our spaces, we quickly found a way to provide services through curbside pickups. So people could in fact still um, have access to, with, with the exception of a, you know, a period of time when everything was shuttered. But uh, libraries were the first to open. We were the first to remain open. We were the first to come back to our spaces. 
Um, we had programs for, as I mentioned, curbside pickup for uh, content. We um, really ramped up our digital access in terms of uh, what was available to to our communities. And we went as far as calling our, our senior citizens to make sure that they were okay because social um, isolation was a, a real uh, concern to many of us in our communities to, to be able to have at least one phone call from somebody to check in on them meant, meant a lot to our seniors in, in, in Kitchener. Let me pick up on that angle, Wisha Michael, because that's, uh, well, before I ask the question, do I have this right? Do you live down the street from Robert Putnam who wrote Bowling Alone? Yeah, I am. I'm not too far from <laughs> You really do. Okay, very cool. Because, I mean, that that's, of course, a seminal book on the sort of, uh, you know, tragic collapse of so many American communities, and I guess up here too as well. And I, I wonder how you saw, you know, it was very tough when the doors had to be closed during the pandemic, and that ability to be a community hub for libraries was not possible uh, when we were all shut down. But how do you see the library now as the place where, where the community can and needs to gather for free to deal with that social isolation that Robert wrote about so eloquently in his book? Yeah, and as, as others have mentioned, you know, uh, as I'm spending my time here at Harvard this year thinking a lot about the public library as a site of encounter, as, as one of the final sort of remaining spaces uh, where people have the opportunity to encounter people who are, are different than them, right? And, and the library is achieving that through so many interesting ways. Um, number one, just as a space, before we even talk about the variety of programs and services that are offered, it is just the space for people to be able to gather, whether that's to come in and grab a coffee, whether it's to sit out in a courtyard and enjoy some shade, just this sort of wonderful space to be. But then on top of that, the library is now layering on lots of different programs uh, um, that, that, that are drawing a variety of people. You know, it's interesting that even though uh, uh, we may have different political beliefs, even though we may be you know, different in terms of, of faith walks, um, there are a lot of things that we actually like to do together. People like to knit, people like to sew, people like to code, people like to learn new things, people like to discuss things that they're reading. Uh, and all these activities do a wonderful job of bringing people together, right? And, and, and this sort of creates a sort of cohesion in which people aren't othering anymore. It's like, oh, I know this person, I know that person. We go, we go to the library together, we attend a program together. And that is a, that does a wonderful thing for the social fabric of the community. You, uh, you are such a, a messianic and enthusiastic supporter of libraries. There's a great story that you tell, and I want you to tell it here if you would, about how the different generations in Memphis interacted as a result of something you put together. Can you tell that story? Sure, and, and I must say that this, this, this was not solely my idea. We have a wonderful uh, uh, individual at the library system, Emily Marks, who put this together. But uh, the story of our library is, is one of access. And, and, and I think it's you know, important to note that throughout the history of the library, there's always been a group of people who have either explicitly or implicitly uh, not felt as welcome as they should. And, and in Memphis, of course, it's well documented that for a number of decades, black people had very little access, limited access to the library system. Uh, and that changed in, in, in the late 50s with a lawsuit and a few years after that with a variety of sit-ins that happened in the system. Uh, and we were able to, through the library project that we did, able to find uh, many of the individuals who participated in the 1960 demonstrations. Uh, many of them were still in Memphis and they had very vivid stories. Uh, they had pictures of what it was like to step into these spaces. They had stories of what it was like to be arrested uh, 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 for stepping into these spaces. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that that history wasn't lost. We wanted to make sure that we honored those individuals. Uh, and thanks to the vision of the mayor, uh, uh, we were able to not only do a mural of the space, but we were able to uh, uh, bring these individuals into the library and connect them with uh, middle school students who, middle and high school students who were not too far from the library. And it was a really powerful moment for these uh, very young students to see, oh wow, there's history here. There are individuals here who had to fight, who had to struggle uh, uh, for access to the things that I'm not able to do in this library. Uh, and, and, and for the for, for the seniors, for those individuals who did the sit-ins, it provided them a wonderful opportunity to be able to share uh, um, why they thought it was important to make sure that the library was a place where everyone was welcome, where everyone felt like they could come into the doors. Brilliant. Sabrina, uh, I want to follow up with you on this. Uh, the notion that everybody kind of gets together in the library. You know, the, how do I put this? Uh, is it fair to say that it's not always the well-off and the not so well-off who are snuggling up together at the library? There's, there's maybe more separation there than people who run libraries would like to think. In other words, well, you know what I'm getting at. Could you speak to that? 
certainly. We we definitely cater to all aspects of our society. Uh, the haves, the have-nots, uh, they're all here in our doors and they are interacting. And it's a place where diversity and equity is active in one place in our society. Uh, it isn't a case that, you know, we're not serving people that we would normally see out on the streets and not not having those access. They are welcome here. They are a important part of our society and an important part of our programs and our services that we provide. Uh, so many of our libraries have gone one step further and started to look at social justice activism within the library. So whether it's a case of our social workers being present, our programs tailored toward people who need those types of services, or it's just our own staff who are being trained on mental health, wellness, and other aspects that we're that first line of defense for many people. Vickery, the library is involved in so many issues uh, including, I gather, food insecurity. How is the Toronto Library System involved in that? Well, that started with the pandemic. And so when we closed three years ago, like everyone else, uh, we had 100 branches closed. And at the same time, we heard through our city uh, that there was this real crisis with food banks. And they had lost volunteers because many of them were seniors and they had to stay at home. And they had lost their, their places um, to, to, to operate their food banks. Mm -hmm. So we um, uh, worked with North York Harvest and Daily Bread and uh, some other partners, and we uh, opened up 12 of our branches as food banks. We asked um, our staff who are at home if anyone wanted to volunteer to uh, work in those food banks in the branches, and within um, minutes, literally, um, we had all the volunteers we needed. The staff were so keen to get out there and, and help people. And uh, we used our book distribution center um, uh, for food distribution. We got all the books out of there, and we used it for food distribution. And now today we have two branches um, still um, with food banks for, with North York Harvest in the uh, parking lot in, in shipping, uh, 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 jazzed up shipping containers. And, uh, and people are being served uh, wonderfully. And we're, this partnership has led to other programming on nutrition, on, um, on um, uh, building um, uh, gardens and, and teaching people how to garden and what food, uh, when you grow food, what it looks like and how you harvest it. Um, so it's been a wonderful partnership and it's been um, uh, really gratifying to be able to serve people in our communities at such a time of need. Sabrina, I gather Toronto's not the only system that does that. You want to tell us about the open refrigerator policy you've got? So open refrigerator programs are, are really important in our libraries and we, we can't all be the Toronto Public Library and have as many staff and branches. So we're doing it in smaller ways where there are simply refrigerators that are open. We can partner with food banks and it's a, a simple aspect of you can come in, take what you need. There is no signing in, no paperwork, just take what you need and others leave what they want. Uh, so these open refrigerator programs are really popping up across our library branches in Ontario. Mary, how about social workers? Do you have social workers in your library? We do. Uh, we have outreach workers that are, we have four outreach workers at our central uh, location, uh, which is our downtown location. Um, and uh, they are embedded with our staff. They work side by side at the welcome desk or what used to be called the circulation desk. Uh, and they're really there to uh, support the community who uh, may be struggling, uh, whether it's homelessness, addiction, mental health, often all three, uh, but also there to uh, support staff, to train staff, to be there, uh, to really, um, help uh, all of our communities uh, succeed in our spaces. Uh, oh, you, you, you dropped a little pearl there, and I wanted to just pick up on that. You don't call it the circulation desk anymore, eh? How come? <laughs> Well, because we do more than that, I think uh, it's a little more integrated than it used to be, where it's just not not just that transaction anymore. So it's uh, re we refer to ours as a, as the welcome desk, where people can you know ask questions, they can be directed, they can of course still check out an item and return an item, but it's it's more than that. And we try to uh, again just by even embedding our uh, outreach workers as an example of why it's not a circulation desk anymore. Sabrina, do you see the library system as sort of part of the social safety net of society now? Oh, most definitely. Uh, we are that one place that you can come and not have to spend money. We're that one place often that people come for the only interaction that they get 
in a day. Our children come for after school, whether it's a formal program or simply that safe space between three o'clock and five o'clock when parents get home. We are the place that our, our youth, our teens, our seniors, our vulnerable sector are looking for supports on a regular basis. All right, Shamichael, I'm following up with you on that then. If there's a lot of social work happening and a lot of these things that we don't traditionally associate with the mission of a library, I guess some people are going to ask the question, should that be part of the mission of a library system? How would you answer that? Well, that's a very complex question. Um, you know, it's been interesting to hear uh, the other responses from, from the other guests uh, about all of the ways that the library is evolving, right? And, you know, whether that is, you know, new partnerships, whether that's uh, food services, food security, whether that is even the sort of the way the library thinks about itself. Uh, I think it's important for folks to recognize that this is not like a fad. L libraries have been since the beginning. Libraries are always finding a way to meet the needs that exist in a community. Um, and, 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 and as those needs get greater, the library is stepping up. Uh, but, you know, what libraries, uh, and I think Victory could, 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 could attest to this, but libraries are having to continually answer is, what are the things that we can do? What are the things that we should do? And what are the things that we just simply can't do, right? Uh, um, and, 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 and I think uh, it's important for libraries to answer that question, you know, based off of what's happening in their communities. But it's also important for the people that fund libraries to be mindful of this and, and, and what they're asking libraries to do. You know, at the heart of all of these programs, at the heart of all of these initiatives are staff members, people who have, a, who have a heart for the community, who want to meet the needs of the community. And often these folks are strapped. These people are being asked to do a lot of different things, uh, perhaps even more than what you might think of a librarian is doing. And so it's important that, you know, as in some cases, social safety, safety nets are failing, that if we're going to direct people to the library to get these services, that we fund libraries in, in, in an adequate way, and we make sure that the people who are offering these services in terms of library staff are actually paid uh, a decent salary. Vickery, going to follow up with you on that. You know, you, you, when libraries were designed, they weren't really thought of as being places where homeless people, for example, mm -hmm. would uh, hang out for 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. They've turned into that. Should they be that? Well, you know, the, one of the great features of public libraries is we welcome everyone without judgment. And when people come into the library, we um, work to serve their needs. And um, one of the challenges, especially through the pandemic, because this has really accelerated during the pandemic, we are seeing more people who are experiencing homelessness. We are seeing more people experiencing mental health um, challenges, um, food insecurity issues, um, uh, opioid over, overdose issues. Um, and uh, so, we are responding uh, to continue to make our place a welcoming place for all. I hear you, but are your but, people trained to do that? Well, kind of we're way? bringing in social services teams as an example. So we are bringing in social services teams um, working with the Gerstein Crisis Center, and those are the interdisciplinary uh, social services workers that'll be coming into our branches, and they'll be working with people who are in crisis uh, and intervening and supporting them uh, and providing the supports that we can't provide as, as library staff. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, we've had to, um, just like we have social workers um, and we, we're um, adding safety specialists to our, to our library branches, we're having to do that because uh, we need to respond to the uh, societal issues that are that are being faced by all of us and are manifested in the library as well. Let me get Mary on that as well in Kitchener Waterloo. You know, there, there are a lot of people who are having a tough time in Kitchener, uh, particularly since so much of the manufacturing sector disappeared in this province, coming back now, but uh, Kitchener's had some tough times and you've had your share of people who use the library system, perhaps for for purposes that it was not intended for. Uh, do, you, do you see the Kitchener Library System, for example, as a makeshift homeless shelter? Well, uh, you know, that isn't our mandate and our role, and that is not what we wish to be. Um, I think that we don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources to be uh, uh, offered uh, that kind of shelter service. So, um, you know, the short answer is no, uh, that we, uh, obviously, we, as, as Vickery mentioned, we have a societal uh, uh incredibly difficult societal challenge right now uh, in terms of social services, in terms of community and finding space for everybody. Um, so what I would say is everybody is welcome, just like Vickery said. And it's all about, and there's always going to be 
you know, there's always tension uh, uh, when community gets together. It's just it, it's just a natural occurrence. Um, and so it's really finding that balance in the tension to ensure that everyone can, as I said, thrive and succeed in our spaces. Um, but no, we, we, we in fact don't want to uh, take the role of a shelter. That is not, uh, not our, our, our uh, mandate, our wish. Um, and so we work very closely with other community organizations to ensure that there is, uh, as much as we can, influence that there is space um, in a timely way that there are washrooms, you know, at one time during the pandemic, the library was the only place that offered a washroom to anybody. Um, everything else was closed. So, uh, you know, working with other community groups to ensure that some of these services are available is really important and a role that probably none of us expected to be in, but here we are. So Michael, let me get you briefly on that as well. You, you mentioned that there are things that the library system shouldn't or can't do. Would being a shelter for homeless people be on that list? No, again, I, I think, you know, I, as, as has been stated, it's important for the library to be viewed as a space where everyone feels welcome uh, and for us to be able to offer that welcome without judgment. Uh, and we have to recognize that, you know, some of the individuals who, who meet that, you know, who, who need that are individuals who are, who are experiencing uh, uh, homelessness, right? Um, and I, and I think it's it's important for us to under, to, to not uh, stereotype that one group of people. As has already been said, that there are a range of things that are happening there. There are people who are experiencing homelessness uh, because of, of pay, right? Like they're, they're not getting a living wage. There are some people who are experiencing that because of their mental health issues. There are some people who are experiencing that because maybe they served the country in armed forces and, and they didn't get the treatment that they needed. Uh, there are a lot of different things that are happening there. And sometimes I think we sort of lump uh, everyone into sort of this one category, this sort of ne negative stereotype of uh, that's not helpful for, for community dialogue. And so I think, the, you know, libraries have and will continue to do everything they can to be able to uh, 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 to, to be a place that's welcoming for everyone. And as you said before, Steve, you know, that does that is challenging. It is challenging when you try to bring lots of different people from, from various backgrounds together. I, I'll share a story with you that I think may be very interesting. Um, one of the one of the individuals who frequented our branch, uh, he, he was one of the first people that would walk through the doors uh, um, as we opened up every morning. Uh, one day, I found out that this gentleman, you know, was, was experiencing uh, homelessness. I, I discovered that he had a talent to draw; that he could pick up any book in the library uh, and glance at that book for just about five minutes and go sit in a corner with a number two pencil and draw something worthy of being in any art museum in North America. <laughs> I said, hey, man, what might it be like if, 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 if you taught a class? What might it be like if, if, we, if we sat you down with people who, who, who want to learn how to draw, learn how to sketch? He said, that, that's wonderful, right? And so now we begin to, to, to uh, help other people see that, hey, this is not a, a group of people that is just a problem to solve, but also a group of people to be understood and to be loved and to be acknowledged as, as whole humans uh, as they are. Gotcha. Uh, we've got a few minutes left here, and I want to put an even more controversial issue on the table. And, Victor, you know all about this because you found yourself in the eye of this um, storm not too long ago. Mm -hmm. You know, free speech. Yes. And the library, and how the library sees its role in either promoting or curtailing free speech. Mm -hmm. There are controversial speakers, and some people don't think that they ought to be allowed to rent a room and give a public address in a library. Uh, you thought differently. How much right. trouble do you get into on that? Well, it was very controversial, as you said. There's a lot of discussion, lots of media coverage. Um, certainly, you know, uh, a lot of um, uh, protests uh, against the decision in Toronto and, and discussions with our staff as well. But, you know, uh, the public library is a democratic institution. And uh, we've, uh, for years, we support literacy and a literate population and free and open access to a diversity of information and ideas. And we protect intellectual freedom and personal privacy, and we preserve the past. And what we're seeing in today's world are more and more challenges to our democratic values and freedoms, including free speech. And the public, li public library, uh, intellectual freedom and equity are two mutually reinforcing principles that are core to our values at the public library. So it's very important, even more important today than ever before, for us to stand up for those values. And what we're seeing 
in libraries across the United States in particular, but it's also happening in here in Canada, are these book bans. Um, and it's become politicized in the United States with late state legislatures um, uh, making uh, laws to, to ban books and to take books out of school libraries and public libraries. Uh, and it's targeted at the LGBTQ plus community and at race and racialized communities mm -hmm. and, and content. And it's a very serious situation. We have drag queen story times in Canada that are being challenged um, and people are protesting against them and demanding that they be cancelled. This is a, a serious issue for us in a democracy and it's a really important for the public library to stand up for our democratic values and freedoms, for intellectual freedom, for free speech and expression and um, it's becoming more and more uh, important in today's world. Let me get Sabrina on this as well. You know Sabrina there are lots of people around us who are watching or listening to this right now who think that legal speech which may be controversial, ought not to find itself hosted at a local public library. What do you say? I, I completely agree with Vickery on this point. Uh, we stand up for intellectual freedom and free speech. What you personally believe and what you personally feel doesn't matter on that. Sometimes we have to stand up for things and books and materials that personally we find offensive, but it's because we have to uphold speech and intellectual freedoms. So it is at the core of what we do. Mary, how about you? It, yeah, ditto, ditto here. Uh, we feel very strongly that we need to stand up for free speech and intellectual freedom. And uh, I think that uh, it is uh, uh, divisive, certainly what we're seeing uh, south of us uh, and a little bit here too. Um, so uh, it is important, I think, as the role of public libraries, uh, certainly in Canada and Ontario, that uh, uh, leadership uh, leads uh, uh, to support uh, free speech uh, any way that we can. Well, um, let's do. Uh, let's finish up on this, uh, I guess, more explicit example. So, Michael, I don't know if you're actually south of us. You're certainly east of us, but given uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts may actually be north of Toronto if I look at a map, but in any event, I, I wonder if a white supremacist group, for example, wanted to, you know, sign up for a room and give a public address in your library. I assume, as I think we all would here, those views are considered repugnant, but would you deny them the right to do so? Well, certainly I don't speak for any, you know, library system. I, I, I am a, I'm a fellow, you know, at the design school, and so I'm not speaking for any uh, particular library system uh, at, at this moment. Uh, but I echo the, the, the sentiments that, that, that the previous panelists have made, just in terms of, you know, being a space uh, that, uh, that should value intellectual freedom. And that's where we'll leave it. Okay, intellectual freedom's a good spot to leave this on. I want to thank Shamichael Hallman for joining us on the line from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Sabrina Saunders from Thornbury, Ontario, Mary Chevreau from Kitchener, Ontario, Vickery Bulls from the Toronto Public Library here in the provincial capital. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.